You're listening to the Sales Success Stories Podcast, where we deconstruct world-class sales performers to provide insights and strategies to help you improve. To learn more, visit us at top1.fm. Here's your host, Scott Ingram. Today, my guest is Mike Dudgeon, who just recently made the transition to sales manager from his previous role as a senior global account executive at LinkedIn, where he was primarily responsible for the Microsoft relationship. So the way I see it, Mike was so successful in that role that the result was a $26 billion acquisition. Mike, you might need to correct the record there a little bit, but welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know um, if I was uh, even a percent responsible for it, but uh, maybe had uh, laid some of the initial tracks. So just kidding. Um, but thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So rather than starting at the beginning with Mike's background and history, we're going to try something a little bit different and start with um, some bigger value right out of the gate. So I asked Mike to think about the top three things that set him apart and allowed him to get to the top. So Mike, I don't know which of those three you want to start with or if you want to outline them first, but uh, what's on your mind? Yeah, I would say, you know, the top three for me has always, and, and some of this plays to to my strengths and obviously leading, learning and, and leading teams now. Um, you know, I think the first one is, is giving, you know, the top three for me are giving to others is number one. Uh, to be paranoid, which comes from Larry Bird had a great quote about paranoia and practicing more than others. And three is be different. Um, and there's three different ways that you can be different. And, and I'll go into those. So I think the first one, you know, I think is fundamental to sales, especially in today with social selling. Um, and that the fact that sales is definitely turned into much more of a consultative uh, approach, which is is giving to others. And I don't see it just being giving to your clients, but also giving to your leaders in terms of giving up. But also, you know, where I work, it's very team based. So helping your peers, both that maybe report into you, uh, but also those who are in cross functional uh, teams as well. And I think it all starts with you have to have empathy for those you work with and work around. And that's really listening to their challenges. You know, everyone, you know, there's a tension span that's that's the greatest issue happening now. Um, and I feel as if you have a strong empathy and can listen to their problems and give them a solution, everyone will always give you their attention if you have a solution. So that's the way I believe you can you can best give to others is listening to their problems and giving them a solution that they can easily sell up. Two is, is being paranoid. Um, you know, there's so many great quotes out there, but for me, it's always been the Larry Bird one is, you know, when he was, when he's going through, I think the, the early eighties, as he was challenging the Lakers, he had a, and I'll paraphrase here is a quote that, you know, I practice more than others. I can't say I've met anyone who's practiced more than me. And essentially what he was re- uh, noting to was the fact that he just lived such a paranoid life that he would outpractice everyone. And, and I think that's the way I've always approached it. Um, not that I'm up at midnight. Sometimes I am being paranoid, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm outworking um, everyone else. And I think, you know, I, I don't really look at outcomes necessarily. I think I look at the process and the progress. Actually, I don't really ever get jealous of anyone who's actually achieved more than me. I think I get jealous sometimes when someone is, is outworking me. And the third one is being different. I think for sales folks, this is going to be huge as, um, you know, the job market changes. Um, we're going to have to be different. We're, we can't just be sellers. And I think you see this where social selling has evolved, where we've taken on much more of a marketing approach, where we've had to develop our own identities and figure out how we're different in the marketplace. And for me, it's always been curiosity. Um, even growing up as a kid, I grew up on a farm and I love just exploring the woods and kind of exploring all of our crops. And I just love just being out there and being on an adventure. And that's what I've always loved about sales is it gives you the ability to go down different paths and to be curious about different subjects and about people and about places that you can go. And with that said is you still got to have fun. Like you see some of the greatest sellers always have a smile on their face. They're always eager to help but they also have a great pride in themselves. And you can just see it in their face where they're confident and they're having fun. And the last one that kind of ties into both is, is taking risk. Um, you know, if you're not taking the risk, you're probably not having as much fun as you could be, at least for me. And you're not probably being as curious if you become complacent. Um, and you're not putting yourself out there with your clients, but also with educating yourself, they're not going to be different. So for me, it's always been about being curious, having fun and taking risks. So going back to the giving piece, talk about that a little bit more in terms of is it is it strategic giving, right? Is there 
intent behind it thinking if i if i give over here then i expect that i can probably get over there how how do you think about that element yeah i think you know especially like i've been working with enterprise um, customers for quite some time and my previous client had if you looked in us alone there were you know primarily we would call on uh, marketings and we marketing folks communication folks but also you know people in pr and things like that and um, being at LinkedIn has become a major hub for distribution within B2B. So there's not a shortage of people who want to talk to you. Um, what I always was looking for um, in terms of wanting to give to someone else was someone who was willing to uh, invest in me as well. Um, because there'd always be people who wanted to hear um, what LinkedIn was up to, what we we're doing, and it was just a pure informational session. So a lot of times I would look at the individual to see, you know, did this person could this person be a champion internally within their organization? And did they want to partner with me or not? Or is just fully just me helping them and it was going to be a one-sided affair? And a lot of times we do find ourselves in these relationships and there's nothing we can really do pr to prevent them where it's one-sided, where you're giving and giving and giving. But for me, it was always um, someone who, who could give back and it became just kind of a, a mutual relationship where I was helping them um, and they were giving back to me in some shape or form. So, yeah, so that's that's how I would, would think about it in terms of giving is you can't give to everyone. So you have to give to others who, who are willing to invest in you. And that's just not monetarily either. Yeah. So so it's just a little bit of, of qualifying. And I, I agree with that. I think some people are and I think it's maybe it's Adam Grant that's written about this a, a little bit. Right there. People some people are wired as givers. Some people are takers and giving to takers doesn't really do much for you. So you've, you've got to kind of qualify on that a little bit. So switching over to the paranoia piece, and it, it also dawns on me, didn't Bill Gates write a book called Only the Paranoid Survive? Yeah, I think it was, uh, was it Andy Grove from Intel, maybe? Maybe we'll have to oh, maybe it was. <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah, I know. See, I don't, I don't know who the author was. Somebody, somebody in the tech space once yeah. upon a time wrote a book. So, and it's funny that you bring up Larry Bird because I was on the other side of that equation growing up with the Lakers in the 80s. And, and that's almost cured me of basketball because it's never been so good since. <laughs> but where do you focus? Like, what's the visualization of who you're paranoid about outworking you? Is it, is it your peers wanting to be at the top? Is it competitors? What's, what's on the other end of that point of paranoia for you? Yeah, for, for me, it's competitors. It could be because LinkedIn's culture is uh, very collaborative in nature. And I know some sales teams, you know, can be much more competitive internally. Um, for me, internal competition is great, but I feel like it could be much more healthy if you can focus in um, on your competitors. So my focus has always been more um, external, but also more internal, um, maybe maybe on myself, uh, more so than than teammates um, at LinkedIn, especially for, you know, I've been here almost six years now and it's been a growth company. So we're all kind of learning as we go. Um, so there has to be a bit of collaboration for you helping the person beside you to, to make sure you're learning, especially in the ad tech and marketing tech side of things, where this thing's changing almost by the month and you need to rely on others to help you out with information and continue to grow yourself. Awesome. Absolutely. And then when it comes to being different, so your third point, I, I think the, the way I heard it, and maybe kind of the suggestion for the listener is kind of figuring out what your own strengths are and how you leverage that to be different. And you're suggesting that your strengths are kind of the work ethic, the taking risks and, and being curious. Is, is that how you think about that? Is that how you would sort of put that forward to other people or to your team? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it comes down to uh, being different is is recognizing the strengths in yourself and, and kind of giving your, yourself the excuse to, to be yourself. I feel like in sales, people still try to hit the, uh, you know, attain this certain persona, which is almost like this extroverted type of person where uh, they look and feel the same. Um, I believe to differentiate yourself, there's only one type of you and that person can be highly different. So I think this is something that you learn over time. Some people learn when they're 22, some learn when they're 42. Um, and so I think it's just continuing to ask yourself the questions in terms of what are your strengths? What feels natural? And for me, it's always just been like, what's most fun to me? And it's always just been, what's been natural to me is just curiosity. And what I've learned over time, which is actually was what we'll get into later, maybe is just kind of fear has always been kind of my weakness. But at the same time, it's, it's been uh, the most fun for me when I'm taking, when I'm taking risk. So those were the three things that, 
that help differentiate me. And I think when I walk into a client, I have always been great at empathy and, and wanting to help. Um, and so I think, you know, what I've laid on top of that is curiosity and, and the fun and taking risk over time. I've learned about myself. Nice. So quick question. We'll come back to the fear thing later for sure. But you mentioned the extroversion thing. Where where do you personally sit on kind of the extrovert introvert scale? <laughs> yeah, so so definitely more on the introvert. Um, my my in laws think that I'm a crazy extrovert, uh, but for me, my strengths I'm very cerebral in my approach, um, and I think over time I've time I've learned that I'm more introverted. I wouldn't say I'm clearly over on way into the introverted path, but um, definitely swing uh, to the left a little bit of of the uh, my friends in the extroverted space. Very interesting. So before we talk about the kind of the background and really dig deep, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank my founding sponsor, Nudge. And without them, this show literally wouldn't be possible. Nudge is a modern sales platform that leverages relationship strength to help you find and keep your best customers. Uh, I've been using it myself since their early beta, and they continue to add more and more to their solution. So if you value relationships the way I do, then you need Nudge. You can sign up for free at Need Nudge. Nudge.com. That's N E E D N U D G E.com. So pretty, pretty good alignment with having you as the guest here, Mike, because uh, it does, it does kind of connect into LinkedIn and connects into Gmail and looks at uh, how often you're communicating with people and suggest things that you might want to want to share. So very, very fun platform for the, those listening. Hope you'll check it out. Um, so Mike, let's now let's, let's do kind of that history lesson. Co can you talk a, lot, a little bit about your role and how you got to number one? Yeah, so my current role, um, I manage an enterprise uh, sales team for our marketing solutions business uh, at LinkedIn. So working with 30 of our top enterprise tech clients here on the West Coast. Uh, previous to uh, this role, which I started here in January of 2016, for four years, I was a senior account executive at LinkedIn, working primarily with Microsoft. Although when I first started, uh, I started in Chicago, working on the likes of of Jim Beam, which was um, it was back in gosh 2000. And 10, when we were still going through a little bit of the kind of economic crisis, and I believe one of the first campaigns I ever sold was uh, to job changers, which were people who were changing jobs because of the economic uncertainty. Um, so it was a unique and creative way to approach uh, the campaign. But um, so now I'm working on the managing side. And for me, um, what se separates me, I guess, is I'm an over planner at times, and that may be a little bit of the introverted side of things, but I feel like with enterprise companies, um, the ability to plan um, and make connections within these large companies can really separate uh, you from others. I feel you know, most people will try to go and kill the big well, um, so to speak, at these big enterprise companies, but really you have to catch a ton of little fish, and that the only way that you're going to do that is uh, through planning. Two, I think... Empathy has always been a strength of mine, and uh, we'll probably get into a little bit of my history uh, at some point, but empathy, the ability to re relate with others, to understand their problems. Um, I've always been just a great listener, and again, that could go back to uh, me naturally being an introvert, um, is something that I've always really kind of been great at, but not only the ability to listen, but um, coming from previous uh, going into sales, I worked on the ad strategy side. And so I always had this built in process to take information and turn it into ideas that were tied to results. And so taking those problems and listening to people and turning those into ideas that are tied to the results that our customers need um, has probably helped differentiate me more than most because not too many folks have that built in process within sales to quickly take that information and have a process that turns it into an idea and a result. And then once the results are there, I'm always good about communicating like positive word of mouth within enterprise companies is your best friend. And so the ability to take any positive result that a customer has and communicate those within an enterprise company um, makes you scale uh, much quicker than trying to go one to one and meet with each customer. And I want to go back and make sure I heard, I, I think I misheard what you said earlier. Did you say you worked with Jim Beam? Yeah. Yeah. I worked with uh, Jim Beam. So when we first started at LinkedIn, we've gone to more category specific. Uh, so we went to like tech, financial services, but back in the day it was in Chicago, I was working with 
ad agencies in the clients Midwest. And as we know, uh, packaged goods is a big, big um, industry in Chicago. And so uh, Jim Beam was one of the first advertisers I worked with um, as we were getting the ad business off the ground at LinkedIn. Very fun. One of my favorite beverages. So I had to ask. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. So hopefully the, the, the uh, ad campaign we had for them was to help people celebrate their new jobs as people were coming back into the workforce. Um, and hopefully a, a little Jim Beam helped them. Got it. Nice. Nice. So you talked about the, the results side of things and we'll come at that from a, a couple of different angles, but maybe talk about kind of your own personal results. Can you quantify those for us and just put, uh, put your success in context for us? Yeah. Um, you know, in the, the first year, especially as we were building the business, you know, we've always been a high growth company. Um, and I can come in here and say that we are always crushing goal and we definitely got to a, a place that we were. Um, we definitely started off, uh, slower than most because we were building something new. And so it was understanding and having to really educate a marketplace on not only what LinkedIn was, but also social. So we were almost building a category in parallel in terms of working with Twitter and Facebook um, that people had had never before purchased or understood really the the key performance indicators that they're going to sell back to their clients, but also internally sometimes with, with ad agencies. And so I would say in the first year um, was probably our roughest. Um, but after that, we build a process in terms of educating folks, but also teaching them how to buy and how to advertise um, on LinkedIn. Uh, things begin to take off. And where we saw over a three-year period consistently, at least with on the business I was calling on, we are looking at 200% growth plus year over year. Um, you know, a lot of that um, had to do with penetration within the organization. Um, sure, there was definitely some tailwind working with social as well as became, um, you know, as we got further into the years, you know, social got some tailwind and took off. And so there definitely was that at play. Um, but in the advertising and marketing business, unless you're hitting these KPIs, you don't stick around long. And so you need to have a positive experience for the clients. Cool. And going back to your comments about the the idea, your ability to take an idea and turn that into results. I mean, can you walk us through at a high level what what, what is that? How how can somebody else kind of take your approach there? Yeah. Um, and my key theme is I don't want to oversimplify this, but uh, you know I try to keep things simple. So for me is. Um, you know, every business has a process. And so I always saw myself as almost this independent business within a greater company. But, um, you know, it first starts with understanding that there's going to be business drivers and there's going to be business hurdles for clients that they're dealing with. They want to take advantage of their drivers and they want to lower their barriers as much to pop as possible so they can overcome them. So knowing that I can be active in the marketplace in terms of listening from clients, but also the internet is such a, such a great trove of information that you can pretty much walk into a client and understand their problems to be able to at least derive some insights, both with what's happening on the internet, what's happening with their business by talking to them, but also LinkedIn is a tremendous resource in terms of understanding insights about their business as well. From there, I take those insights. And for us, at least within the marketing business, there was also audience insights. So, you know, for example, for Microsoft, what is a business decision maker up to on LinkedIn? What type of content maybe are they consuming? And be able to generate ideas. So where they can maybe distribute to certain audiences on LinkedIn, what type of content they should be connecting with them with um, is the next process or the next step in the process. And third is what type of results should they expect? And so setting expectations of what those results could be and should be so that they can also take what I've created for them is essentially a business case that they could take up to their boss and say, hey, I have this great idea that I think LinkedIn can help us with one of our barriers or help us with one of our drivers that I think we should look into. So I, what I've always looked at the business case is it's almost refrigerator material. Either they're putting on the refrigerator a result that's going to help them with one of their OKRs uh, for the year or an idea that is a big shiny idea that gets them recognition, but also helps them with their overall business result. So the first one's insights. So where can I get insights either from the customer, from the internet, or for me, it's always been LinkedIn and our own product. Two is um, ideas, which a lot of it comes from uh, the whiteboard. Um, and working with my team. And third is what type of results should we expect or should they respect and should we be striving to get for them and then making it nicely packaged into almost a business case that they can take forth to, the, to, their, uh, to their leadership. 
Oh, it's great stuff. Thanks for sharing that. So Mike, what's, what's your origin story? How did you get into sales? Yeah. So I started off um, on the media strategy side, working at uh, DDB, which was a large agency, still is a large agency in Chicago, working on uh, the McDonald's business. I had two tours of duties there. Um, I helped launch uh, Monopoly, if you've ever played the game. Um, I helped with 101 Dalmatians, if you've ever bought the, the lunchbox there. Um, but I also worked on Dell Computers um, when they were starting to get into the early days of... Um, using marketing for revenue generation. And so actually for both customers, I saw for the first time um, how marketing can impact revenue. And so we were actually measured and we could, could tell based upon our media buying habits, how much store traffic we'd be generating for McDonald's. And for Dell, we could actually see how much revenue we were driving for them based upon their media spend. What was the return on investment in terms of revenue, um, almost by media channel as well. So those are my first days in terms of working to get revenue uh, for a company. Um, but also I love the creativity because you really had to use your mind to figure out how was I going to use all these media properties to generate ideas with them that could result in a net positive ROI for them. Um, after a while, I moved on to an, a few new accounts that were less revenue focused. And I took a sabbatical where kind of where I was talking about before is one of my greatest strengths is empathy. Um, I also enjoy learning about the human body. So I actually went into a sabbatical where I studied uh, physical therapy and volunteered for seven months because I thought I uh, wanted to, to help people a bit more, but also <laughs> recognized doing that, that maybe I didn't have as much empathy for folks as I thought, uh, not in a bad way, uh, but it does take a lot. And I got to have a lot of uh, credit to, to nurses and doctors and physical therapists out there because it does take a lot of out of you to, to help people in the way that they do. But I recognized that I missed the creativity and the ownership I'd have in terms of um, being responsible for um, I wouldn't say revenue recognition didn't necessarily drive me. Maybe it's the creativity and the ideas to help build businesses is what I missed. And so I knew I eventually wanted to get into sales to kind of own my own kind of outcome. And so I went back on the agency side, working on business development. I worked at a small agency, uh, driving new accounts um, into the agency. And then I, I got a great break. Uh, I w went over to Newsweek to work with probably the best mentor I've ever had in sales, Bill Youngberg, Youngberg who is probably going to be retiring here soon. And he took me aboard and I had a tremendous year for, with him uh, before I went over to uh, the Wall Street Wall Street Journal uh, to work in the digital network, which then led me over uh, to LinkedIn. So that's kind of the, the long overview of it, but uh, it was twisting and winding. And I'd say uh, through each kind of transition, there's something I took that's kind of led me to where I am now. I think from the agency side, it was a set process in terms of how to take information and turn them into ideas and, and to get them through results. The physical therapy thing there was just probably scratching an itch I had in terms of empathy and wanting to help others. And then the business development side was, was I think for me more than anything was just to help me get into sales. And then from there, I just had tremendous mentors helping me um, from my first day at Newsweek uh, to my first day at Wall Street Journal and then coming here aboard at LinkedIn. Oh, great story. So if you were starting that process over today, would you have done or thought about anything differently from a career perspective? Yeah, I would have gotten the sales earlier. <laughs> I think I think it's a little bit of... Um, it was the introverted side of me. And I think two things were at play is uh, fear has always been a, a challenge, I think, for me. And I think it comes a little bit from the introverted side. And I always had this theory or belief that you had to be this huge extrovert to, to be into sales, um, which um, I think it, it can give folks um, uh, an advantage for sure, without a doubt, being extroverted. But, um, you know, introverts now definitely are at play. Um, you see a lot more folks coming in from the consulting side of things, participating in sales. I think if I would have just taken the risk sooner and gotten into sales, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it so much. And I think what I've, what I've learned before getting into sales, I think has definitely helped me, but I w really wish I would have made the jump, um, a lot sooner. Talk about the mentor piece a little bit more. It sounds like that started because you found maybe a really great leader that you were working for. Is Has it been primarily that and just making sure that you were working um, under good folks? How, how, do, how do you think about mentors in, in general? Yeah, I think, you know, that's where, you know, I think we've all heard the classic, you know, quote of, of always work for a great leader, don't work for a great company, some something to that effect. But 
um, you know, there's been times in my career where I've chosen a company um, over the leader, right? There was a big shiny brand that I went for versus the leader. And I would say that um, that that was a mistake um, that, that I'll never do again. Um, but the mentor standpoint, I, you know, for me at the time, because I was a bit more introverted than most, um, Bill Youngberg helped me a ton because he's definitely over on the extroverted side um, and probably brought it out of me a, a lot more than I, I realized. Um, but also was extremely uh, kind and compassionate in the development of me. I think he, you know, it, it was pure luck, frankly, um, getting such a good mentor. I would like to say I was conscious at the time and selecting him, but he selected me. And, you know, I think it was having compassion and understanding of my unique skills. And I think he just did a great job of, of bringing them out of me in, in such a short time. And I wish, I wish I would have been more, more selective or conscious of that decision, especially even after that. I don't think I realized at the time how great I had it. Um, but I would have, uh, that's one thing I guess I'd recommend to people is just be conscious of, especially through the interview process. And when you're looking at leadership, it matters, um, so much, um, you know, the results thing is, is definitely there, but making sure that you have a good leader who has a process, but also, um, has compassion to learn uh, about you and understand your strengths and, um, know how to put those strengths to, to use. How can you flesh that out? I mean, as, as you're interviewing for a role and you're trying to figure out, is, is this the right person to be working for given it, that level of importance? What, what can you ask? What can you look for? What, what's the best way to kind of figure that out? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of knowing what you c connect with, right? You know, I've always seen it. Um, even with the A's I have now, you know, I've, for me, it's always a partnership, right? Like, um, there's definitely a, a manager subordinate, I guess, element there, but it's also, um, is the person willing to partner? Um, so I'm always looking for someone who, um, has the same type of things I'm trying to, or I want to achieve. So that could be revenue, that could be growth through education, relationships, whatever that may be. Um, but also someone who has um, opposites where I maybe I lack, um, where, you know, for Bill, for example, it was, um, you know, he was a little bit more extroverted and I was introverted. Um, serendipitously, I, I bumped into him, but I look for those types of things where, where's the strength that they, um, have that I don't have. Um, you know, for example, my director now is tremendous with operations, like plugging all the back end things to make something go. I'm not that great at it. Right. And so, um, that helps me learn from him, um, how to do those types of things. Um, and third is I think just, you got to get along. Like, is it going to be, does this seem like the person that you could go uh, have a drink with or have a dinner with, um, on a frequent basis? And so I think a lot of that just comes from like, in terms of finding that out is, um, you know, with LinkedIn, you can definitely tell who they're connected to. And, um, as you move through your career, you're able to have more connections. They just ask people like, what is this person's style? What is their approach? Um, but definitely even now is just asking them up front through, um, even before maybe the interview is like, Hey, what's your style? What are you looking for? Like, what are you trying to get to? It's just like a good sales call. Right. Um, and there's been clients that I've turned down because I just didn't feel like it was going to be a good fit. And so it wasn't going to be a good experience for them. It wasn't going to be a good experience for me. Kind of take the same approach in terms of when looking at new leadership, you know, do I feel like this is going to be a good relationship or, or not? Yeah. Great, great thoughts. I mean, I think it's always important to think about the interview process. I mean, it is a sales process at the end of the day. Um, but I've always thought you have to qualify crazy, crazy hard because it's the only time that you only have one unit to sell, <laughs> right? I can, yeah. only, I can only sell me once in, in those scenarios. There's, there's not a bunch of them. I can't move on to the next one. So I think it's, it's probably more important for, um, the, the sales professional to be doing the qualifying even more than the, than the hiring company, because, you know, even on a team, you're one of X number. Yeah. And I, I would say too, even for the, the leader, like even going through the interview process now, and I've been doing this for 
what, nine months now is I make sure to the person, I'm like, do you have enough information for me to make a decision on us and me? Um, because I don't want to have, I don't want to have anybody have regrets. Right. And that would be the worst thing possible. And so, um, I actually take more time to say like, look, we've got an extra 15 minutes here. Let's just get down to it. You know, um, this is, this is what we're looking for. This is the type of, this is how I work. Like, what do you, what do you want out of this job? Um, and can we give that to you or not? to essentially qualify, is this a good opportunity for you? And is it a good opportunity for us? Yeah, important stuff. So Mike, from an accomplishment perspective, what what are you most proud of, whether whether at LinkedIn or, or maybe someplace else? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's uh, maybe it's recency theory, but for me, it's, um, you know, the ability to, you know, I'm having such a great time here in, in San Francisco. And I think uh, the accomplishment is just uh, being here and being able to compete with, with some of the best talent um, in the world and being able to support uh, a small, small but growing family um, here in the city uh, for me is tremendous just based upon where I came from in terms of growing up in a farm. And I think my dad still to this day probably thinks I'm coming back at some, some point to participate um, on the farm. But um, I would say where I am today, um, it may be a little bit of a cop out of an answer, but the fact that I'm in San Francisco competing with some of the best and able to, to help support a, a family here is a tremendous accomplishment to me. But if you're looking for something specific, Scott, I can try again. <laughs> Let's try again. I mean, that's, that was a little too fluffy, Mike. Come on. Too fluffy. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, two years ago, I was the global AE of the year for LinkedIn. I would say that was a, a big accomplishment um, for myself. Um, just, you know, given, you know, was based out of Chicago, you know, had a non endemic book, meaning, you know, uh, worked with the Jim Beams, the McDonald's of the world, which aren't exactly consumer products lining up to, to use LinkedIn for advertising needs because we're much more business to business um, to be able to, to work through that and to um, attain a, a large client like Microsoft and to become one of the best AEs at LinkedIn globally um, was a huge accomplishment um, for me, um, both in pride and see that, you know, my work and kind of my theories in terms of sales had paid off. Um, but also for, uh, my wife at the time, still today is my wife, um, was super proud just to see, um, she knew how hard I was working at, at getting there in terms of, uh, definitely a lot of trial and error, um, uh, the, the first few years at LinkedIn to, to develop a certain process, um, that clients respected and liked and, and to see that come full circle and to see, um, high results and also be recognized for, um, being the global A of the year was a huge accomplishment. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. See, you're you're <laughs> clearly a little overly humble, Mike, but the, I appreciate your your sharing that. So on on the flip side, and and maybe I mean you've alluded to it a couple of times. Maybe it was that first year at LinkedIn. Maybe it was another time. And what's the biggest challenge you've had to face, or or maybe even place us uh, at that time when you struggled the most? What was going on? Yeah, I think, um, and I kind of alluded to this is, you know, being a bit more introverted, it's, it's always been the fear of putting yourself out there. Um, but I've been able to make that a, a fun thing for me, um, just because curiosity has always driven me. Um, you know, I've churned it into something, uh, that is more fun. So I've done fear challenges where I'll do like five, seven day commitments, uh, to overcoming, certain fears. Um, sounds very Tim Ferriss-y, but uh, Tim Ferriss, for those of you listening, I don't, his name isn't Ferriss-y, but um, you know, I'll try to do challenges where I overcome fear and that's helping me um, kick out a little bit of my introvertedness um, and put myself out there where there's a consistent pattern where it's the, it, things aren't as fearful. Um, you know, I think it goes back to, I remember my parents, I really wanted to do karate as a kid. And I remember, um, my parents had bought me this cool karate. I don't really know what you call it. If there's karate folks out here, Taekwondo folks, I apologize for betraying it, but it was a karate outfit um, that my parents had gotten me. And I remember they took me the first day of karate and uh, they asked me to break a board. I think I was like five years old and I, 
pretty much left there crying. And my dad said, you'll go right back in there and you'll, you'll give it a try. And so I've always, that was like one of the most fearful moments of my life and still kind of, as you can tell, resonates with me. So I've <clears throat> took the same approach of if there's something uh, that is extremely fearful for me, I teared, I tend to go more towards um, the fear now. And so one of the challenges um, actually for me has always been, I've been, um, uh, I always just didn't like getting on the stage. And so, um, I did a, uh, three day challenge where it may seem, uh, minor to people. Um, but there was a large industry event, um, that I presented at followed by, uh, improv course the next day. Uh, and this may seem easy to others, but not to me, but karaoke on the third day. This is my most recent fear challenge um, because I knew I had these things. I had a presentation that was uh, to be presented to an industry folks. So I tacked on two more things that were made of fear in terms of myself getting in front of a stage. Um, some people say they don't see the fear, but it really does take a lot out of me sometimes to, uh, to put myself out there like that. That's awesome. So if, if I heard that right, it's really, you've, you've been, introspective, right? Really understanding what that fear is. And then it sounds like really just crafting challenges and, and having ways to run towards the fire and, and get through it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for, again, it's, you know, I put a little bit more process into it. It's definitely like awareness. Like I, I spent a ton of time probably more so, and this may be again, the introverted part of just time to understand, like, you know, how am I doing mentally, physically, spiritually, all that stuff and just have awareness of it. And then I create a small, very simple plan. Um, but then I give myself uh, certain kind of consequences, consequences, like positive consequences. So if I do these challenges, I'll give myself self something at, at the end. Um, that at least is some sort of reward system, but I also give consequences in terms of just like telling my wife I'm doing this. There's no way that I can back out of doing it. And so there's the consequences for essentially saying like, Hey Mike, did you do this or not? Not in a weird way, <laughs> but in a very, in a very much like, Oh, you didn't do that. Oh, I thought you said you're going to do that, that type of way where, uh, not wanting to let her down. So yeah, I would say there's, understand there's fear there, which is awareness, making a small but simple plan, and then just giving yourself some side, some sort of uh, accountability and also consequence. I usually make it a positive consequence, which is usually a Starbucks or small technology purchase of some sort. Nice. You answered my next question, which was, you know, what, what are the positive consequences? So what, what was the most recent small technology purchase? Uh, the most I, um, well, I just, uh, uh, did the pre-order on the new iPhone seven, um, which was the most recent. Um, but the recent most small, well, we did get the Apple TV, um, and I'll probably be, uh, having to, I'm afraid to get an Xbox, uh, haven't been much of a gamer, but I'm afraid if I get an Xbox and maybe turn me in, into one, but, um, with the Microsoft acquisition pending, um, I am interested in what they can provide from an entertainment standpoint for for the family very interesting i was, I was going to say you totally screwed up the evergreenness of the show calling out the uh the iphone 7 launch but i'm in that same boat with you <laughs> yeah and and then i <laughs> yeah, can't so. i cannot do i i cannot start gaming i'm i am so competitive and it's like okay well i have to conquer this and it will consume my life so i mean it, that's sort of it's almost my drug like i yeah it's like crack you know you just you don't don't do the first hit because it just leads to bad things. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know if we'll we'll be uh, we'll be purchasing one, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, I would say the I'm I'm eager to see the iPhone Seven. Uh, lots of I've got a young family, so lots of lots of pictures. So they sold me on on camera. Nice. Well, you you mentioned Tim Ferriss, and I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan. So that's kind of a perfect transition into this. Feels like the the Tim Ferriss uh, inspired portion of the show. I'm, I'm curious if you do you have a, a specific uh, morning routine. Maybe, maybe that's harder now that you've got quite young children. Yeah, there's uh, there was the pre kids routine, which was amazing, <laughs> <laughs> and there's the post kids, which is um, I'm working through it. But yeah, for me, I just know. Um, I'm a, I'm a morning person. And so I'm usually up somewhere between four and five, just, we have a young one right now. So depending on sleep, like my wife has been just great at helping me, 
you know, sleep. Um, my wife, uh, stays home and, and takes care of the kids. And so she takes one for the team and typically is up, but we live in a small apartment. Um, as I mentioned before the call built before the 1900s, which is retrofitted for earthquakes, but you can still hear through the walls. And so there's still a little bit of waking up, but now I wake up between, uh, pre, I was definitely up between four and five. I love road cycling. For, so for me, it was getting out the door and getting on my bike um, before six was a big thing. But I also like to crank on some of my either my big ideas or um, email before I leave the door. There's a bit of uh, accomplishment I like to feel before I get into to anything else. And if I'm not doing email or working on something big, I like to go over my, my plan again. I know some people might sound as if it's crazy, but for me, it's just like that's where I'm best is in the morning. And so I like to crank on the hard stuff I need to think about because come four or five, I'm, I'm like crashing. And so I know I have to get up and do it, or I'm just not going to be as effective during the day. And then I'm going to have that five to seven to eight guilt <laughs> that I didn't get enough done. And so then I try to, you know, typically in the past, I would love going out and going cycling or, or now I do a lot more running just because it doesn't take as much time. And so I'm out the door. I'll typically do a 30, 45 minute run, um, every other day now, um, I used to run marathons in the past, but those days are gone. Um, then I come back, I'll work a little bit more, more like review email, just because a lot of New York emails are coming in at the time. Um, I'll spend time with the kids between seven and eight. And then I live two miles from work now, um, in San Francisco. And so I use that time to walk, uh, listen to podcasts and, or audio books. And so it's, uh, it's really an enriching time for me. <laughs> Uh, my wife makes fun of me. She's like, I can't believe that you call that an enriching time. I'm like, well, I get to walk. I commute myself. We save money and I get to do a little bit of, of learning. And so, um, yeah, that's typically my morning. And then I'm in, I have a sense of accomplishment. So I've got some momentum going into nine o'clock and then, uh, I'm off and going. That's awesome. Yeah. sounds, sounds very, very similar to, to my schedule. And I was thinking, you know, one of these times, uh, when I'm out your way in San Francisco, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to maybe do the paradise loop together. It's one of my favorite rides. Yeah, nice. Yeah, definitely. So uh, are there other, we talked about the morning a little bit. Are there other habits or routines that are really central to your success throughout the day? Yeah. So usually in, in the morning and a lot of this, um, you know, I've, I've learned from others, but also just trial and error. Um, you know, I don't like to go directly into meetings. Again, I know I'm a morning person and my, my energy spikes in the morning. And so I'm trying to work, you know, between nine and one on projects. And then I leave the back half for any sort of meetings. Um, that usually helps me. And then, um, <clears throat> on the way home, I'll either do calls or again, listen to podcasts, but also my way in, I'll try to knock out calls. If anyone wants to chat between eight and nine, I do a walk and talk. Um, so yeah, that's, that's typically how I structure. I'm, uh, even moving into the new role. I really try to block out time for, uh, building stuff. Um, you know, I totally believe that there's a, uh, a, a manager schedule and there's a creator creator, um, schedule. And I definitely see the, the AEs as the creators, but I still try to maintain a little bit of a creator schedule, creator, um, schedule to hopefully build stuff. I mean, we're still in the business of, of building things because we work in advertising and marketing. Um, I'm either building process or I'm building ideas, uh, to help our clients or help our AEs. So I try to block out as much time as possible to build things versus just um, being in, in meetings just because I'm, I'm a manager now. Right, right. So what is what does your information diet look like? It sounds like you've got the podcast going on. What's what's going in your ears? What are you reading? What, what are you watching? Yeah, so uh, podcast wise, you know, I'll do everything from self-improvement, um, you know, think listening to things like Tim Ferriss to Michael Hyatt, Art of Charm, which sounds like a, a podcast that um, is like for pickup artists. It may have actually started that way, but it's really just understanding kind of human psychology. I do some Zig Ziglar type stuff. Um, but I also, so people don't think I'm too crazy on the business side. I listen to a lot of <laughs> Barstool sports podcast <laughs> and also Dan Carlin's hardcore history. If there's any fans out there, I'm a, a huge fan of that, but my, my top one is probably Tim Ferriss. I think he just does a great job with just interviews, but also just interesting and differentiated information. Also my favorite is, um, James Altucher show. If, uh, for those who, who are listen, listeners, but also uh, spend a ton of time on 
um, audiobooks as well. I'll switch back and forth between that and podcasts. And those are, I'll do a heavy like month or two on podcast and then I'll do a heavy month or two on books. Um, and other than that, like I spend a lot of time in newsletters. I feel like that's my best way, um, to keep up to date on customers, but also on what's happening in the industry. And then I'll do a lot of Google alerts in terms of like information I have to know. So, um, you know, at the time it was any information I needed to know about LinkedIn that Google was crawling, um, but also on Microsoft. And so I'm getting every day um, as many updates as possible about our customers. And so I really just try to keep myself ahead of even my customers in terms of knowledge about their company, but also knowledge about their industry as well. Um, that would make me well informed when uh, when meeting with them. But I'm not all business. Um, I do a ton of, uh, not a ton, but we spend about an hour a day probably with TV, my wife and I, in terms of just like a um, way to way to relax. So, we'll, you know, like everyone probably, we, we watch Game of Thrones. Um, we watch a lot of different comedies and something to keep it light at the end of the day. But my wife is trying to get, trying to get me into reading now instead of watching TV. So we'll see how that transition goes. Often helps with sleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those newsletters, I mean, we're both in the in the marketing technology space. What what are maybe some top two or three that really stand out where you consistently get good info from? Yeah, well, the the usual one is um, for the marketing business. I feel like whatever happens on ad age is typically where the the market um, goes in terms of our buyers. Um, but I use a smart brief brief as well. Um, I read, uh, which is from, um, IEB. I also do things like, um, I'm going to mispronounce his last name, but, uh, Ramit Sidi, um, which does a lot, um, on copywriting. Cause I'm always, um, just interested in the art of copywriting, especially, um, in the digital age. I do, uh, Ben Thompson, which is a subscription newsletter, which I highly recommend for, it's called strategic, strategic, I feel like I'm saying like the George Bush strategery, 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 I can't <laughs> even say it now, um, which is, is just a phenomenal read, which covers the, the tech space, probably the best, I would say, newsletter um, out there. And then Jason Hershorn's um, uh, uh, newsletter, which is great, which is i um, trying to think of it here. I don't know why I've lost it, um, but it's, oh, Media Redefined, uh, Media Redef, which I highly recommend for anyone who's in the, the media business. It's a nice recap in terms of uh, the media as a whole, just not digital, but also TV, print, radio, you name it. He does a great job covering it. I think he was the former CEO of MySpace and now just does a phenomenal job with uh, this newsletter. Are there any tools or apps that, that you can't live without? Yeah. So I, for me, uh, live without. So right, <laughs> LinkedIn, obviously, uh, number one in terms of yeah, <laughs> Good one. Uh, running my business. We also have um, uh, a, a separate app called Elevate, um, which is really focused around employee engagement. And so what it does is um, curates content within the app so that employees can share that across their social platforms. So if you think about a company like Microsoft, which has 100,000 um, uh, employees and the amount of connections that they have within their network, even if 20% of those share, you get tremendous reach, but you also get the ability for them to build their own personal brands, which, which plays really well with um, social, social selling. But uh, beyond the LinkedIn promo, um, Instagram has been a, a huge fa a favorite for me, um, especially with kids. But also, I just I love um, some of the marketing and advertising that's happening on there. Um, but those would be my, um, sadly, uh, my only two that I, I consume content uh, from. Well, content in the sense of uh, either entertainment or professionally. Uh, the other ones I use are Spotify. It's when I'm zoned in. But I use a ton of, of travel apps um, like TripAdvisor, Yelp, Foursquare, just because uh, part of the job, again, I love being curious. And so when I'm traveling for this job, it gives me the ability to check out new things in new cities, new restaurants and things like that. So um, American Airlines is my preferred airline. So I, the American app and then Starwood is huge for me too, in terms of where could I go? Where could I visit? Those types of things. 
Um, and then a lot of the a lot of the Apple apps. So as we were talking about with podcast, um, I use the podcast app. I use uh, video editing, um, picture editing, all within um, iPhones. So a lot of the native apps that are on there as well. Um, yeah, I would say that those are, are my go-to. Obviously, the Kindle is, is a big fan favorite of mine because of reading, uh, and then Audible as well for um, uh, for listening to the books. Oh, last one, Pocket, which has been a huge, huge savior of mine in terms of finding articles uh, because I have so many newsletters. I'll open an article and then I want to continue to read it. And so I'll, I'll slide it into pocket and I'll come back to it later. Um, that's been a big one for me. And then this will be a fan favorite for you, Strava, which is the one that I love for, for competition, both in cycling, uh, but also in running as well. Tracking, tracking. Myself. Awesome. We will, we will have to follow each other. I am not in the shape that I <laughs> I'm need with to you. be right now, but, uh, it's, it's getting to be, it's getting to be fall. So it's not 110 in Austin and it's, it's a good time to, uh, to be going out and doing that. Um, so from a D you, you mentioned travel or, or the travel apps. Does, how do you structure your schedule? 